Good morning, and welcome to Grace Bible Church. This is the part of the service where we take a few minutes and celebrate the Lord's Supper. Um, we remember what Christ did when he went to the cross, and that's what I want to do this morning. Um, as I was preparing my lesson this morning, I came across Acts 2 and just was stuck in it. I could not get out of um, just being impressed with how Peter relayed the gospel and how the gospel was heard and how the gospel was responded to. And so I want to spend our time this morning in Acts 2. So if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to put one in your hands. And if you do, please turn to Acts 2 this morning. Um, there are men here that will be handing out Bibles. Just raise your hand and they'll, put, they'll give you one. This morning, I want to answer three questions about the gospel from this passage. I would love to spend a long time in this passage and go through everything that there is to learn about God and the gospel in it, and yet I have eight minutes. So we're going to look at just a few glimpses of the gospel from it. The first question I want to be able to answer this morning is what must we know about the gospel? If we are to understand the gospel, how do we need to know it? What do we need to know about God and what do we need to know about our Savior. And, and Peter gives us that in a middle section within his sermon. Um, and so he's preaching to Jews, and he, he describes um, a lot about what Christ did when he came to the earth. And in verse 22, we will start there. He says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst. Just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of lawless men and put him to death. But God, but God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Peter is teaching the crowd three things here. He's teaching them first that Jesus was God, and he proved that in their midst. If you look at the book of John, we learned about this when John described the miracles of Jesus. And if you go to John 20, and you don't have to go there now, but I'll read it to you. In John 20, 30 and 31, he says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also did in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been, been written so that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Jesus was God, and he proved that in their midst when he was among them. And the second thing Peter was teaching the crowd is that Jesus going to the cross to save sinner was always God's plan. Imagine being part of the crowd that called for the crucifixion of Jesus and then not long later told that that crucifixion was part of a predetermined plan of God. He knew it would happen all along before they were part of that crowd. And then imagine being part of that crowd thinking you were obeying the law by sending someone that blasphemed God, but instead you were lawless and the one that put the Messiah to death. And that leads us to the third point. Imagine realizing that everything Peter is telling you is true because Jesus proved he had power over death by being raised up. What a great line and thought is in that verse where it says, it was impossible for him to be held by death's power. Jesus' power over death wasn't some struggle. In fact, death had no power over him. The power of death and the power of Jesus are not on the same level. There was never any question what was more powerful. It was impossible for him to be held by death's power. And that leads us to the next question about the gospel that we want to answer. And this is the question the crowd asks in verse 37. Now then, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men, brothers, what should we do? This is good news that they were pierced to the heart. They were thinking about what they had done. They were feeling the guilt and the anguish and the concern that they sent Messiah to the cross. And now they understand the significance of that. 
and they appeal. What must we do? If we know that Jesus is the God, if we know that Jesus is God, and he went to the cross for sinners, and he alone has power over sin and death, what must we do? 238 answers the question. Peter answers the question. Repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter told the crowds to turn from their sins and submit to the one who had power over sin. Jesus will change your heart. Jesus will forgive your sins. Jesus will give you the ability to turn from your sin by sending the Holy Spirit after him. If you understand this truth and understand your need for the Savior this morning, but you have not turned from your sins, the same message is for you. Repent. But if you don't, when we pass the elements out in a few minutes, please let them go by. This is a time for those who are in Christ to worship him. And, and that is really the third question. The last question for today is how must we live? Christian, this is for you today. How must we live? We know this truth. We've repented. What does this passage tell us about what a life changed looks like? And the answer to that is in verse 41 and 42. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and on that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Imagine that. Imagine being a part of a a sermon where 3,000 souls completely transform in their thinking, where God raises 3,000 hearts from the dead. And so what was their response? And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. On the day described in this chapter, 3,000 were converted and their lives were immediately transformed. They were baptized and saved into a body of believers. Their lives were immediately connected to one another and they were continually devoting themselves, meaning they were close to, they attached themselves to, they were putting an emphasis in their lives on these four things. Think about that for a second. If someone close to you, observed you, what would they say you are continually devoting yourself to? As I thought about this this week, um, the first thing that came to my mind was I would, people would probably say I'm devoted to my family. They'd probably say I'm devoted to coffee. I would hope they would say, and I think those close to me would say that I'm devoted to this church in the lives of you guys and to God's word. Um, I, I actually felt conviction this week that maybe coffee has too much of a a prominence in my life and I need people around me to see something different, to see a devotion to prayer and worship more prominently. So as you examine your own heart, where do you think the focus is too heavily on and where do you think you need to shift? These 3,000, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They didn't have a Bible like we have today. They devoted themselves to the gospel. They knew the Old Testament, and the apostle was sharing some life-changing gospel information. They were devoting themselves to that. Are you devoted to God's word the way they were? Would someone say you're devoted to the teaching of God's word? We have equipping hour, main service, Sunday night, small groups, build, wellspring, many other teaching opportunities at this church. And when I interact with people in this church, I am so encouraged by the way you guys are affected by God's word. It, a Sunday doesn't go by where I, or every Sunday, I hear someone say, oh, did you hear last week's equipping hour? Did you, did you hear what Jacob taught about joy and fun? Did you learn about contentment this morning? Um, I think this church is a church that is devoted to God's teaching, and I commend you in that. And, and that even leads to, they were devoted to the fellowship. Are you guys devoted to fellowship? Absolutely. I've seen real deep conversations in this church, and it is a joy. I mean, then we're about to do the next thing, which is devoted to the breaking of bread, devoted to communion, devoted to a worship of God through things that we do to honor him and love him. And one of those things is communion. And then we will pray together, like they did. They were devoted to prayers. I believe these are corporate prayers done together like we do when we have elder prayer each week. And so these are things that the early church was devoted to, and these are things that we are committed to as a church. And so this morning, as the men pass out 
the cup and the bread, please just examine your heart. Look at what you're devoted to and, and grow in your love for, for these four things. Men, go ahead and pass out the elements and then I'll come back and close our time in prayer.